Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for our fifth and grand finale of the Maimer Bossi Lagani 5721. This is the Maimer that the Lubavitcher Rebbe said on the night, Friday night, before Baruchu, Metzai Yud Shvat, Tov Aleph, 1961, 5721, based on the 11th chapter of the original Maimer Basi Lagani Achaisikala that was published by his father in law, the Rebbe Rayatz, for his own Yoim Histalkas for the day that would turn out to be the day that he passed away, which was Yutshva Tov Yud, Shabbos Parish's boy, Yutshva 1950. This year's Kvias is the same like the year of the Histalkas, the Rebbe Rayatz passed away Shabbos morning around 10 to 8 in the morning in his home on 770 Eastern Parkway on the second floor. And uh, he published a mimer for that day, the day before. That was the mimer Basi Lagani. It consists of 20 chapters. And in 1961, the Rebbe discussed and learned and taught and explained the 11th chapter. So please download your source sheets. As I said, you can go to theyeshiva.net. <coughs> the first video, Basi Lagani 5721, number five. On top, there's an icon, a green icon, download. If you click on it, you could download the source sheets. We are up to ch- uh, page 11. Page 11 in the source sheets is also view source sheets, which will replace the video, uh, which will uh, open up on the screen if you don't want to download it. That's also fine. So page 11. Uh, Sif Ches. If you're using the Kuntras that we're using here in our house, it's page Yud Ches. If you're downloading the source sheets, it's page 11. If you're using this Kuntras, Maimer Basi Lagani Tavshin Chafalaf, then it's page Yud Ches, chapter Ches. In both cases, it's chapter Ches. How are we doing with Zoom? You could see me and hear me? Yeah? Gewaldek, okay. Beautiful. You all know that if I give a real summation of what we learned in the last four weeks, (laughs) we'll be sitting here. We'll be sitting here for another four weeks. At least. (coughs) So let's just recall literally in a few sentences the summation of the summation of the summation of what we learned. In the chapter 11 of the original Maima Basi Lagani, the Rebbe Rayatz, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rebbe Yosef Yitzchak, discusses why Jews, the Jewish people, are called Tzivis Hashem. In fact, in Parshas Boy, that's when we receive the title, Vahib Etzim Yahyeh Mazah, Yatsu called Tzivis Hashem, Me'eretz Mitzrayim. All the Tzivis Hashem, the legions of Hashem, left Egypt. And he begins discussing that Tzvayas is a holy name. It's one of the seven names that we don't erase, as the Gemara says in Shavu Islam and Hay and the Rambam and Hilchus Yisraeliyah Teireh Peireh Gvav. He discusses the fact that this name was revealed only through the prophets. Which, by the way, we're in the middle of learning the Maimah Teireh Eir Parshas Boy, which is focused on this whole sugya, why Tzvayas only is revealed later in history through Chama. We already learned two shiurim in that. We're going to continue that tomorrow morning, Bezer Hashem. So you can join us Friday, 7.30, for the end of the Maimer in Torah, er, about the name of Tzvayis. And from this, he gets to the Medrash. The Medrash Rabbi says in Shmois, the Hashemosh asks Hashem, what's your name? Hashem says, you want to know my name? Lefi masayani nikra. My name is always changing. It's based on my actions. When I'm in a state of combat with wickedness, then I'm called Tzvayis. A state of compassion, I have a different name, Yudke Vavke. A state of judgment, I have a different name, 
Elikim, he goes through the different names in the Medrash. Tzvoyis is the name connected to Melchama, war, combat. Shariyoyer, Rabbi Yosef Giktili, one of the great Mekobalim of the 1300s, writes, he was a student of Rav Rama Balafia, he says, Tzvoyis is associated with Netzach and Hoyt, which he brings in the Maimur. What's the connection? So he starts explaining at length what Midas HaNetzach is, the attribute of victory. The real attribute of victory exists only by the greatest of the great, by a real Melech, because we're not talking about stubbornness or stamakshanas or taking revenge <clears throat> because you have to win. We're talking about the real concept of Netzachen. It's not even to get booty for war. He says, the real, the real Melech who's aligned completely aligned with Hashem, wants that the emes, the emes of Hashem should be revealed in every place. And as long as that's not revealed, there's something very deeply missing. And in order to achieve this victory, he splurges all of the treasures, even those that were assembled for many generations from his fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers and forefathers that were never shown. Even if they were shown, they were never splurged, they were never disseminated. They were never distributed, but for the victory of the war, the Melech is ready to disseminate and splurge everything because the Midas HaNetzach, the attribute of Netzach, is deeper than everything, even deeper than desire and deeper than pleasure. So all the pleasure and desire that he has in these treasures ultimately fades away at the moment when the combat is happening and the king needs to be victorious and then he will give away but it's called Bizbuz HaEisris, these tremendous, tremendous treasures to the point his own life will be at stake. His own life he will sacrifice, he will uh, put on the line, he will himself go on the front lines in order to be able to win the war. <coughs> because the Midah, the Midah of Nitzachayim is rooted in the, in the deepest part of the soul, even beyond the conscious life of the Melech. In other words, I care for my life, but victory is rooted in me, even in a deeper place. So I care for victory even more than my conscious life. And that's why he will splurge everything. And to whom? He'll give it to the simple foot soldiers, through the generals, through the commanders, but it's ultimately going to go to the simple foot soldiers in order to win the war. This was a summation of the Rebbe Rayatz's chapter 11 of Basil Lagani. And on this chapter, the whole Bossi Lagani, 1961, Dr. Chafalov is based. And the Rebbe discussed at length the idea of names, Lefimase Ani Nikra, the paradox, revealing an astonishing depth in the structure of chapter 11 of his father in law's Maimer. At first glance, it just looks like there's no real connection. He starts talking about Jews are called Sivis Hashem, Tzvayis is not mentioned in Torah, it's only mentioned by the Nevi'im. And it's connected to war, and war is connected to victory, and victory is rooted in the essence of the soul. What's the connection in all of this? Well, you start off that Jews are called Sivis Hashem. Then you tell me Tzvayis is not a name in the Torah. So it's only by the Nevi'im. But you say Jews are called Sivis Hashem. It's very hard to understand. And then you get it off to this whole idea of combat and Netzach. So in the Rebbe's Maimer, he shows the astonishing, intricate depth and subtlety in the structure of chapter 11, which is very hard to notice. Generally, sometimes in the Rebbe Rayatz's Maimarim, there's so much contained, but you have to really, really know how to decipher the underlying structure. In these Maimarim of Basi Lagani that the Rebbe discusses and explains the Basi Lagani of his predecessor, the Rebbe Rayatz, we get to see some of this. So for this, he shows the whole explanation of how to understand Hashem's names. There's a paradox. Hashem's names are based on his actions, Lefi Masai. But then you say, Ani Nikra, it's my name. I have the name. In other words, it's not just an external name that's alien to me. Ani Nikra, it becomes my name. But, but the I, the I is unchangeable. And the name is all about changes. It's all about actions. How do you explain that paradox? And for this, you remember he went into the long explanation of the view of Rabbi Moshe Kordavero, the Ramak, and the view of the Baal Shem Tif, and the view of the Alter Rebbe, how to explain names. The Ramak who discusses that you always have to focus a love on him, on the light. The Baal Shem Tif who says you have to find the him in the vessels, in the structures. 
We spoke about Kav and Rishimu, or Hagvul, or Habligvu. The Alter Rebbe who wants to fuse it all together. The Ur and the Keli, the finite and the infinite, by introducing the essence, the Et Atzmos itself, which transcends infinity and finiteness and therefore fuses them together and therefore an Atzmos. You never get stuck in one or the other, but there's always the fusion, the integration, the synthesis of Koyach HaGvul and Koyach HaBligvul with the long explanation of the Magid about what happens on Yom Kippur and why Yom Kippur the Kayin Gadol can utter the shame on Mephirish and the nation can hear it. The whole explanation of the Magid, why we don't pronounce Yud Kevavke, we pronounce Alav Dalad Nun Yud even when we write Yud Kevavke. Negat Shema Vachme, the whole explanation of the Tzimtzum. After all of this, we understand that the ultimate fusion of Ihu Vigarmoye, of Hashem Himself and His Kalim and His Levushim, come from Atmos, and the more you go down into a world of structure and, re- and it becomes one with the Ein Saif, it's rooted in, so to speak, deeper in Atmos, which means that Svois, this, this is where it comes together, that Svois, which is the name that deals with combat, which is a space of complete separation, is rooted in the deepest place, that name Tzvayas, which is only added later by the Nevi. It wasn't there by Moshe Rabbeinu. It's rooted, though, in the deepest place. That's what Midas HaNetzach is. This is all a summation. I know a very brief one, and if you didn't hear the first four classes, it probably did not uh, add up much. But I will encourage you to listen to the first four classes when you have a chance. Make sure it's on double speed. So uh, you could do other things also. It won't take up your whole week. And you'll uh, you have a better appreciation. Now we continue inside. Again, if you page if in on the source sheets on the yeshiva.net, it's page eleven. If you're using this contrast, it's page yud. It's page page yud ches. Half speed is better. Half speed is better. <laughs> says half speed. Okay. <laughs> Somebody told me he listens on triple speed. Another person tells me you tell me to listen on double speed. It's like listening to meditation on double speed. It's like listening to music on double speed. He says, you know, it's not for double speed. You have to take it in and breathe it in and internalize it in this. It depends. Some people are looking for data, for information, and some people are looking for experience. The last point that we learned, this was in last week's shir, is how the name Tzvayas develops. In the days of Moshe, Jews are called Tzivas Hashem. By Yahushua, somebody shows up and Yahushua says, and he tells Yahushua, Ani Sar Tzva Hashem Atabasi. I am the minister in God's army. I came now. I tried coming by your teacher, but he threw me away. Your, your Rebbe Moshe would not accept me. So I only came now, Atabasi, and Yahushua accepts him. Yahushua doesn't expel him. Yahushua takes off his shoes, they have a conversation. Later in life, a few hundred years later, Later in history, Chana calls Hashem Tzvayis. Shmuel prophesizes in the name of Hashem, Koyamar Hashem Tzvayis. And the last prophets constantly use that name. Like Chagai, Scharia, Malachi, Tehillim, Sefer Tehillim, use that name Tzvayis. And he explains that there's, this is a devolution. Tzvayis Hashem is, there is complete alignment with Yudke Vavke, which is the Eir of Atzilis. Then there is, Hashem being called Tzvayis, which explains and explains in Torah or Parshas Boy that Tzvayis is a name that's connected to Bri Yitzir Asiya, because it's a name of combat. Combat is only with an enemy, with, ad- with an adversary. In other words, there's somebody outside of you who may even be rebelling against you. So that exists only in the lower worlds, in lower states of consciousness, where there's a separateness. Over there, there could be the name of Tzvayis. So to call Hashem Tzvayis is not originally in Jewish history. Because again, Hashem's name is Him. Lefi Masai Ani Nikra. But at a later stage, at a later stage, when there is the need to go out to battle, so the Chiddush of Tzvayis is that the divine core, the divine essence, is manifested in that as well. Hashem Oizri, Hashem helps you in that battle. It's Hashem's name. And as we learned earlier, in a way, it's even deeper because in order to go to a lower place, remember, the fusion with the lowest is always rooted in the highest. The more finite, the more atmos in order to fuse the infinite and the finite. 
So that's where Midas HaNetzach comes in the Midas of Tzvoyes, which is rooted in the depth of a person's essence. So from the state of Moshe Rabbeinu, Tzivos Hashem, Tzivos is not a separate name, it's Tzivos Hashem. It's a, it's a prefix to Hashem, Tzivos, in the army of Hashem. Then you have Tzivos as a separate name, which develops in the time of the Nevi'im, to the point that it becomes Hashem's name, Hashem Tzivos. In the language of Chassidus, Tzivos Hashem is an Atzilus, and Tzvayis is in Bri Yitzir Asiyah. And we, who often live in that world where there's adversaries, where there is combat, where there's darkness, begin with Tzvayis. We have to begin with Tzvayis. And know that that victory, that battle is rooted in Etzem HaNefesh. It's rooted in the Etzem, Etzem of Hashem, so to speak who wants Einoid Mulvade, that the truth of Elikus should be expressed in every single part of the world. There should be a complete victory without any enemy. In other words, like we say in Rosh Hashanah, V'yeda kol pol ki Every existence should ultimately become aware that it's part of cosmic oneness. That's the era of complete peace, of complete victory. There's no enemies, there's no polarities of good and evil, those who oppose godliness and holiness. The oneness is revealed. That's the Midas HaNetzach. And from Tzvayis, we can climb back up the ladder. He says, there's Tzvayis, there's Tzvayis, Oisu B'Tzava Delay, and then there is Tzvayis Hashem in the days, like by Moshe Rabbeinu, but it's going to be deeper than by Moshe, because Moshe was beyond nature. Moshe is the face of the sun. There's no changes. Yeshua is the face of the moon. There is no stability. And then we come back to Tzivis Hashem, which is Ishapcha, which is the transformation. And that's the ultimate connection, how the Maimer began, the Maimer of Yud Aleph, of the Rebbe Rayat said, that we're called Tzivis Hashem. And then he says, Tzvayis is one of the seven names. And Lefimaisi, Ani Nikra, what's this whole connection? This whole connection is, now we get it. That of course, in the time of Moshe, we're called Tzivis Hashem, because then, the victory was of a completely different magnitude. It transcended nature. It was like a victory from Elam Hatzilus. Ultimately, though, we have to go into a place of battle, and that's when Tzvayis becomes its own name. Hashem is called Tzvayis. But that's also Ani. And not just Ani. It comes from the depth of Atzmos, and that's the Hemshech of the Maimah, that Netzach is rooted in Etzim HaNefesh. And that's where he discusses how by Netzach he, splur- he splurges all of the Oitzris, all, all of the treasures. You typhus the Indian. Just trying to make a, a little bit of a summation here. Again, I know it's not so clear if you didn't learn it, so I'm going to encourage you to learn it so we can go right. Let's now go inside. Let's go deep. Let's go inside. Let's go further inside. Sif Ches. If you haven't downloaded the source sheets, please download the source sheets. Again, on the yeshiva.net. On top, you'll see an icon uh, download in this mimer. Everything in Yiddishkeit and in Jewish life begins with Torah. That itself is a statement you could sit on. Torah is the blueprint of the universe. It's the blueprint of history. It's the blueprint of life. So any reality that we discuss is first in the blueprint. If you want to understand anything in a house, you want to know where any aspect of the house is, you have to go and check out the architect's blueprint. We're talking about an architect who really made a blueprint, and the contractor followed the blueprint, which can often be a miracle in today's day that the architect and the contractor are on the same page. But in the real, a real blueprint, it has everything. It has it, of course, on the level of a blueprint. You have to know how to read a blueprint. But it's all there. There's a story that uh, they brought to the Alter Rebbe a map of, a, of the United States of America. Now you have to understand, this is the 1700s. So the maps were not like the maps that we have today. There were no satellites. America was a pretty, uh, it was developed, it was the 1700s, but it was you know, relatively new. And they brought al a map of America. And he took a look at the map. And he said that there's an error. He said there's an error, and he showed a mistake. Okay, you know, some people thought there, if they didn't know, they thought, uh, <laughs> sitting in a little shtetl, a little shtetl in Lyazhne in Belarus, Mamish, a little shtetl, I was there, a little town, and he's saying about the map of America, there's a mistake. Later, 
there was news that came back that the map was erroneous. There was a mistake there, I think, somewhere in California, West Coast. So they asked al Rebbe how he knew. So he said that in the letter of the bays of Bereshus Bara, Bereshus, you have the map of the world. So when he saw the map, he saw it was not consistent with the map in the letter bays of Bereshus Bara. So he knew there was a mistake. It's interesting, a few years ago, somebody showed me a story in the New York Times about maps of the 1700s that were made that had errors. I don't know that it was one of those maps, but they had pictures of a few maps of the 1700s that had serious errors in America. Stop. When I saw the story, I remember that story with Alter Rebbe. What's the point? The point is, it exists in the blueprint. So every reality that we talk about begins with Teira. So these two realities, what are these two realities? Tzivis Hashem and Tzvois. Tzivis Hashem is the way Tzivis is part of Hashem. It's not a separate name. In Torah, there's no name Tzivis. Hashem never assumes the identity of Tzivis. I'm running an army. Even though there are fights in Chumash. Hashem nilchem lem b'mitzrayim. Hashem ish milchama, not Tzivis. Because the battles in the time of Moshe are completely beyond nature. They're run from the perspective of Olam Hatzilas, of Olam Ha'achtos. There's no Teva. Pnei Moshe ke Pnei Chama. Afterwards, Hashem assumes a name Tzvayis. And as the Alter Rebbe says in Torah, Parshas Boy, it represents the fact that in the days of the Nevi'im, the Torah had to also descend into a new place. If not, the word of God could not reach the soul of the Jewish people. They would remain separate. Sometimes, if I want to reach your soul, I have to take the information and bring it down into your space. So the Torah, the divine energy, had to go, so to speak, from Atzillus into Briya, Yitzir Asiya, and Hashem has a new name. It's called Tzvayis. What are these two aspects in, in Torah? So he says, This is the difference between the two streams of Yiddishkeit. One is what we call Nigla, the revealed part of Torah. One is called Pnemis the inner, the esoteric, the elements of Torah's Hanister. What's the difference between the two? More generally, you have the difference between Torah and Tfila, between davening and learning. And what's the difference between the two? The tefillah he avoided b'derech molchama. The Torah he avoided b'derech shalom. Generally, the avoid of tefillah is combat, and the avoid of Torah is peaceful. K'may shekasev pader b'shalom nafshi shekoy al Torah. When David Hamelch says Hashem redeemed my soul in peace, kapitel nun hey intilim. This is referring to Torah. Shal yad nasa habdiel legamri melo umaza because through Torah. One can be completely emancipated from the lo'umaza, from the negativity, from the other side. Lo'umaza means the counterbalance of kedusha of holiness. What does this mean? There's a very fundamental difference between Torah and Tefillah. Or as a famous expression in Chesidus, in davening, you speak to Hashem. And in learning, Hashem speaks to you. Davening is about me finding the purity within myself. Real davening is a battle. I have to work through my external layers. That's why there's so many machshav when you're daven, right? All these thoughts that come in. Because davening is really the discipline and the work of working through the darkness, the skeletons, the debris. And getting into your nefesh kiss, your inner divine pure core that transcends your scars and wounds and traumas and insecurities and fears and egotism and narcissism and all the other wonderful adjectives that we talk about. That's tefillah. The avayda of tefillah is b'derech molchama. It's working through your issues. That's what tefillah is. Tefillah is divine therapy. Tefillah is the ability to be able to say, Eilecha Hashem ekrav al Hashem the ability to be able to celebrate the ability to be able to say or to be able to feel the va'ata in the kulam. That's a, that's a, that, there's a lot of mulchama there on many different levels. Torah is very different. Torah is you're coming to Hashem's shir. You're tuning into the divine energy. In fact, Torah, you're not discussing yourself. Tefillah is like, tefillah is called karbonus. Tefillah is for, for karbonus. What's karbonus? Karbonus, you have to take an animal and sacrifice it. 
and take its blood and take its fat, its chius and its passion and its fattiness and bring it on the altar. Torah is very different. Torah is a very peaceful experience. Torah is, is actually not about me. Torah is, is, is tuning in to a divine revelation. Torah is min ha-shamayim debarati yimachem. It, it, you're listening to it, it's a very different impact, it's a very different way of dealing with a person's inner space. And these are two parts of Yiddishkeit, e, very, both equally valid, Torah and Tefillah. Tefillah is Melchama, Torah is, is Shalom. But if you, go, if you want to be more specific, because everything can always be discussed generally and then specifically and more specifically. In Torah itself there's two streams. There's a part of Torah that's very combative. Gali the Torah yesh bekushi o machlaikas. You learn a shtikl gemara full of combat. There's debates, there's questions, there's refutations. It's intricate intellectual analysis. Everybody knows you could sit on a piece of gemara for a week. You could sit on a piece of gemara for a month. You could learn a mesechta 20 times and come back and it's like you never learned it. There's always deeper and deeper, but it's full of kushyas and machlaikas. Mashen ki pnimi satayda les tamon lai kushyav alay machlaikas de sib raya mehemna. Raya mehemna, which is a section of Zayar, says that pnimi satayda is not defined by kushyas, by questions, by machlaikas, by debates. Vezeu ha mitis inyan abdiya b'shalom shakai al pnimi satayda. So in Torah itself, there's two elements of Torah. All of Torah is divine. All of Torah is divine wisdom, but there's a difference. Nigla de Torah is an intellectual pursuit. It's a very intellectual pursuit, and it's a very intricate pursuit. And it's full, and the way we come to the truth is, is always machlaikas. And every page of Gemara, almost every page of Gemara is filled with arguments and debates. And the arguments and the debates are for one purpose, to be able to arrive at truth. So it's not tefillah. Tefillah is where you're working with your own inner challenges. Torah is God's wisdom, but it's the way Hashem's wisdom is expressed in so many different views and perspectives and debates. What's Pnimi Yisatayda? Pnimi Yisatayda comes to show the oneness of everything. Pnimi Yisatayda comes to show the inner light, the inner divinity, the inner flow of godliness. That's why we say in Tayda itself, Pnimi Yisatayda is the Shalom, it's the Padre B'Shalom Nafshi. Nigla the Tayda takes everything apart, and Pnimi Yisatayda wants to bring it all back together. A good Sugi and Nigla you have to dissect, right? Adin in das, adin in das, loyre kareze, loy kareze, adin in the gavra, adin in the chefza, apoyel, apoula, nifl. It's it's all about dissection. Lahavdil science, good science. That's what you do. You take something and you want to dissect it from every single angle. It begins with the blueprint in Torah. Pnimi Torah, you want to bring it all back together. It's about the achdos. It's it's showing the divine flow, the edelkeit in everything. The nekuda sapshitus, the undefined essence that pervades everything. It's one Torah, it's not separate. The Zayar says it's a soul and a body. You don't separate the soul and the body. But the body is defined by compartments and different organs and different limbs. And the soul is the electricity that fuses the entire body. It brings life into the entire body. It's the nekuda sa'achtus that unites the entire body. And both are essential, both are essential, because Nigla the Torah gives us the information and gives us the background and explains to us the rational, the svad in each shitta. So you have a Mishnah, there will be a debate, then the Gemara will discuss the reasons for the debates. And then each view itself is debated. Rashi has his view, and Toysavis has his view, and the Rambam has his view, and the Rajba has his view. And then it comes down in Halacha. The way it comes down in Allah, and then there's different views how to explain the Allah, and then there's a debate there too. But this is all the divine wisdom being channeled through each svara. Pnimi Yisatayra, less tamam loikush of Alemachlaikas, it's defined by finding the inner serenity, the inner tranquility, the inner divinity that flows through all of Torah. You see now the connection. So you have tefillah, you have nigla, and you have pnimiyas. That's the three levels of tzvayas that he spoke about. This Tzvayas, as Hashem's name, the divine energy, the way it's manifested in the structures of Bri, Yitzir, Asir, where there's combat. And Hashem, Ani, is called Tzvayas because Atmos himself confused the infinite with the most finite reality. That's the Avaydeh B'derech Melchama Tefillah. You have Oisu B'tzava delay in the ascent upwards. Oisu B'tzava delay is Torah, which is Shalom, but still B'derech Melchama. And then you have Atzilis, Tzivis Hashem, 
Moshe himself is Torah. Zichru Torah is Moshe Avdi. And in Torah itself, you have the Pnimi Yisat Torah, the wholesomeness, where you see the goodness of the world, the wholesomeness of the world. In Nigla, there's still a dichotomized world. There's good and there's evil, you know. There's Reuven, who is the perpetrator, and Shimon, who is the victim. You have the plaintiff and you have the defendant constantly. In Pnimi Yisat Torah, we reveal the Achtos. So he says, The real revelation of Pnei Yisatayda comes when Mashiach comes. Rashi says in the beginning of Shir Hashirim on the Pasuk, He will kiss me with a kiss of his mouth. That when Mashiach comes, he's going to reveal to us <coughs> The secrets of Torah, the, the real reasons of Torah, and the underlying hidden concealment, concealed layers of Taita. Why? When Mashiach comes, what happens when Mashiach comes? The spirit of purity is removed from the earth. How? How does that happen? So it's not that God will snap his fingers, abracadabra, kadu, there's no tum, no. What happens is it's the gili of Pnimi Yisataira. When Pnimi Yisataira, when the blueprint of the world, of Pnimi Yisataira comes out, so we start seeing the pnimius of the world. When you see the pnimius of the world, then Tumma doesn't have substance anymore. Tumma only has substance when there's concealment. When the vision is clear, when all the doors of perception are cleansed, everything appears as is, an aspect of divine infinity. And that is the ultimate victory. The victory is not just that there's booty. You remember we learned last class, there's the war where I want the booty, I want your territory, I want your treasures. That's like spiritually, I want to get your nitsutsus, I want to get out your sparks. That's one level. But then there is complete victory, there's no opposition anymore. Ah, birudim we have now too. What's birudim? Birudim comes from the word bayre, like in Hilchas Shabbos, right? Simon Shin Yutes and Erechaim. What's bayre? Bayre is you have a salad, you have the good parts in the lettuce, you have the bad parts in the lettuce, and you bayre, you select, you separate one from the other. Well, Beirut, you're not allowed to do on Shabbos. There's no Beirutim on Shabbos. Unless, one, one second. Rebbe Nsiya, one second. Let's understand. You're not allowed to take the bad from the good on Shabbos. You're allowed to take the good from the bad as long as you're not using a vessel and as long as you're doing it in order to use it now. For example, if there's a part of salad that I don't like, I happen to like tomatoes, but if I wouldn't like them, I happen to like onions too. But if I wouldn't like onions, I'm not mechuy of to eat onions. I could just take the parts of the salad that I want and eat it right away. I can't separate it to use it later, but for now it's fine as long as I'm not using a professional keli, the vessels that I used for this. But I'm just bringing an example. What's the concept of boyde? The concept of boyde is avoid sabirudim. Avoid sabirudim is the avoid of clarity, of separating, like borer, clear, boyde, to sift, to separate the clarity. That exists now. That's throughout all of history. Where Mavada, in everything, there's divine, holy sparks that you have to be able to extract and take out. And he says, today, there's only pachem ktanem, little jugs that are left over. Like it says by Yaakov that he went back. The Gemara says because of pachem ktanem, little jugs that he left over, and that's where the battle was. So sometimes it's very small jugs that have nitzutzas in them. But it's still not the purpose. It's not, not the ultimate purpose. The ultimate purpose is the nitzachain. The ultimate tzachin is that there's no metziyah salo anymore. It's not just avayda sabirudim, that's like the booty where you go to get out to extract the sparks. The avayda is that the whole metziyah salo umazah is gone, that the world should be a world in which there's absolutely nothing left besides the gili of Einaid Mulvad. You know that everything is transformed. That's what the real victory is. There's victory, the king wants to go in and he wants to get your booty. He gets your booty, he goes back, or he wants your territory. The ultimate idea of Nitzachin, though, you remember we learned about two types of Nitzachin, is that there shouldn't be a corner in the world where the emes of a lakus should not be felt. There'd be no opposition whatsoever. It's not that I go in and I'm a varibirudim and I extract the sparks from the husks and then the husks I disregard. But rather that there's no husks anymore. There's no clip anymore. There's no le'umaz anymore. That's the ultimate Nitzachin. That's 
This is what Mashiach reveals in the world. Rashi says he's going to teach us Pneumisa. What does it mean to teach us Pneumisa Taira? He's going to give us the microscopic eyes that when I look at every situation in the world, what do I see? I see the Elokus there. I see the opportunity for Avaida Sasham. Even in a challenge, even in adversity, even in trauma, even in scars, even in wounds, even in difficult situations, what do I see? I see the divine purpose there. I see the goodness inside of it. I see the goodness inside of every part of myself. I see the goodness in every part of yourself. I see the goodness, the opportunity in every part of the world. I don't see an enemy anymore. The real Pnimi Satayda is a vision of cosmic oneness, a vision of complete oneness. And that's what Pnimi Satayda allows you to live with, to breathe that oneness. How you relate to your spouse, how you relate to your children. There is a relationship that's based on combat. <laughs> Right? I'm right. You're right. Who's right? And then there's a relationship that's based on oneness. It's a very different type of relationship. It's one in which we try to see not our differences, but our connection with each other. And even the differences between us are not seen as a cause of machlaikas. They're seen as different ways in which the oneness is channeled. Diversity is also an aspect of oneness. This is a different vision of the world. It takes the training, this is the training of Pnei Meisataira to be able to look at the cosmos and see that, that achdos. And then there's no clipper, you don't live in a world of polarities, you only live in a world of achdos. Ah, you say, what do you mean? This guy is fighting with me, this one is arguing with me. No, 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 it's all my projection. I'm looking at it from a perspective of machlaikas. I'm seeing machlaikas everywhere. If I can go into my own, it's always inner work. It starts here. It doesn't start there, right? We don't point fingers like that because when I point like this, I'm pointing at myself. When you point a finger at somebody else, you're pointing three fingers at yourself. It starts inside of me. When I go into my own pnimius, when I find pnimius atayr in me, in other words, when I live with real achtos Hashem, then I exude that energy. Then I see it. Then I create it. I identify it everywhere. But for this, I can't live in my traumas. I can't live in my own machlaikas. And I can't live in my own splits and my own, uh, my own inner, inner fragmentation. I have to be able to make peace and open myself up to my own inner peace and tranquility. And that's the gift of Pnei Yisrael. And that's what Mashiach reveals to the world. He reveals to the world. That's what Rashi tells us. Soy the achtos of the world, which comes from the achtos of Torah. So you could think, let's wait for Mashiach. He says, no, it doesn't work that way. Since all of the revelations of the future are dependent on our Aveda today, it's not like Mashiach is a new world. One day God says, okay, Mashiach is here, there's a new world order. Mashiach is the revelation of what we do today. To give a simple example for this, if there's, a, if there's a play, let's say a camp play, and the curtains open up, and you see a beautifully set stage with props, actors in uniforms, so only somebody who doesn't know the facts could think that they w- it was created when the curtain was opened. No, this stage was set up already two weeks ago, and it was hard work. You had artists, and you had builders, and you had makeup artists, and you had tailors working on producing this magnificent stage, which is the arena in which the play is going to take place. But the curtains were closed, so you didn't see it. The world of Mashiach is not created when the curtains open up. It's created through Golas. Mashiach is Hashem opens the curtains. So we see the world that was created through our Aveda throughout all the years of exile. So So the beginning of this revelation, which revelation? The revelation of complete nitzachai. We are not only being mevare birudim, you're not only going for the booty, you're not only going for the kill and extracting the sparks, but you're seeking the complete oneness, the complete nitzachai, that there's no opposition, there's no enemy, it begins now. It's known from the middle of the Rebbe Teres Chaim. He says the Yira Shemayim of the Baal Shem Tev was a foretaste, was something of a, a of a, of, a, of, a, of the same type of the Yira law 
of the higher awe, the highest reverence that Mashiach is going to have. That's what he says in Teres Chaim. The year of the Baal Shem Tov, like the year of Mashiach. What does this mean? And the chsidis, the mayanas, the wellsprings that were revealed through the Baal Atanya, through the Alter Rebbe, are a foretaste of the Torah of Mashiach. The year of Shemayim of the Baal Shem Tov is the year of Shemayim of Mashiach. At least a mayain, something of it, a part of it, a foretaste of it. And the Torah of the Alter Rebbe is a mayain of the Torah of Mashiach. What's the Rebbe saying here? This is a, this is like a dichter statement. What's the, what's the, what, a lot of, there's a lot of many Jews who are Yerush <laughs> We all know Jews who have real Yerush He uses here the words, There's two types of Yerush There's a Yerush what you call a fear of heaven. And Yiddish says, Us might have and you're afraid of Hashem. Why are you afraid of Hashem? It could be you're afraid of, of, of you don't want to lose Elam Haba. You don't want to get punished. You want to get the rewards. You're afraid, you know, that everything is a din v'cheshben, right? Everything, there's a calculation, there's a, you're accountable, there's consequences. You're afraid. And you can have real year. <laughs> you can have real year for that. There could be deeper levels of year, perhaps. It depends on your knowledge, on your discipline, on your spiritual sensitivity. So there's, there's a lot of different components and levels of Yerush We speak about Yerush HaOinesh. We speak about sometimes um, Yerush HaRoimimus, a fear of exaltedness. We sometimes speak about Yerush Boishas, a fear of shame. Different experiences of Yerush the year of Shemayim that he's saying here about the Baal Shem Tev, which is the year of Mashiach, is the year that's based here on the deepest, on the Pnimi Yisatayda. It's the year that comes from the deepest place. It comes from the Yechidah Nefesh, which is revealed through Pnimi Yisatayda. What is this? This is the year that comes from an appreciation of Einoid Movadai. It's not the year I'm going to get punished. If I don't do it, God is going to punish me. Which, which could be Yir Shemayim. You're, you're afraid. You're afraid to do the wrong thing. But then very often what happens, if I could find a loophole, <laughs> I'll find a loophole. In other words, if I'm not going to get punished, <laughs> if I can get permission, I'll get permission. If I can find a heter, I'll, I'll find a heter. I'll, I'll do the heter. Why? It's not a Yir Epinimis. It's not an awe that's coming from my internal self. It's more of a forced type of fear. <laughs> I have a choice. It's a depressing type of fear. God is the big boss. He's in control. You got to listen. If you don't show up at work, your paycheck is not going to be the same. And if you don't show up for a month, there's going to be serious consequences. And if you're a serious Jew, you realize this life is very temporary and transient. 70, 80, 90 years, 120 years, hopefully 180 years in your case. But ultimately, you have to face eternity. You have to face... You're a serious guy. This is no small year of Shemayim. Somebody who lives with a recognition of Olam Haba, somebody who lives with a recognition of But this is more of a forced Yer Shemayim. The Yer Shemayim the Baal Shem Tev taught was a Yer Shemayim of Tainug, a Yer Shemayim of ecstasy, a Yer Shemayim of delight. It's the Yer Shemayim that comes because you don't want, you're afraid to separate yourself from truth. It's a different type of Yer. Let's talk about it in a marriage. Sometimes you're afraid, are you afraid of your spouse? Some people are afraid of their spouse because there's consequences. There's consequences. If you not, if you don't live up to the ksuvah, there's going to be consequences. You don't want negativity in the house. First of all, you don't want your wife should punish you, your husband should punish you. Even if you're not afraid of punishment, you don't want negativity in the house. You don't want a negative ambiance in the house. You don't want toxicity in the house, right? But that's a very... Uh, it's a more, it, it, it could be powerful, but it's more external year. Inner year is Shemayim. Tim is year Shemayim is this relationship is so powerful, I'm afraid to tamper with it. I'm afraid to destroy it. It's too good. <laughs> We're too close for us to be separate. I'm afraid of ruining such a powerful relationship. This is year Shemayim of Tainug. We're so close. I love you so much. 
Our relationship is so real. It's the most real thing. I'm afraid to tamper with such a relationship. That year of Shemaim, I'm not looking for loopholes. It's not like, ooh, I found the heter. My wife is not going to find out. You know, I can go flirt with somebody. My wife won't be there. Nobody will take a picture. It's going to be somewhere where there's no, uh, there's no, uh, there's no cell phone. Nobody's going to take a picture. I'll do it. It's not about finding out. Now, with God, he's going to find out. So the year of Shemaim is much deeper. But if I could find a psalupo, if the Mishnah Brura gives a psalheter, I'll go for the heter. The year of Shemaim of the Baal Shem Tev, what the Baal Shem Tev started to teach, it's not only the Baal Shem Tev, obviously, but the Baal Shem Tev emphasized it. It's a year of Shemaim that comes from Achdus Hashem. It comes from the fact that you're one, that you're divine, that you're completely connected. So I'm afraid to engage in anything that's going to separate me from the emes Hashem la'olam of Einoid Movadah. This year, Shemaim, I'm never looking for a hetri, I'm never looking for a way out, because it's not about punishment. So the year, Shemaim, of Pnimi Satayra, is authentic. On the contrary, it becomes my natural, organic self. Afraid of heaven, afraid of God here, doesn't mean I'm afraid that lightning is, lightning is going to strike me. Yir Shamaya means I'm afraid to tamper with such a relationship. <laughs> or it's scary to know how much God loves me. <laughs> it's scary to know how much God loves me, right? That's, that's, that's the Yir Shamayim. It's the Yir Shamayim, it's the awe and the reverence of every single moment being a tool for infinity, being an ambassador of Hashem. That's the years of the Baal Shem Tev that he says was like the year of Meshech. This is what Pnimi Satayra teaches you. It's not a year of Shemaim you want to get away with or you want to get over. It's not a checklist. It's organic oneness. It's who I am. A Jew who has year of Shemaim, it's because he is really in touch with his own Pnimi and the Torah of the Alter Rebbe is a foretaste of the Torah of Mashiach. What's the Torah of Mashiach? It's the Torah of oneness. It's the Torah where no part of the world has to be amputated. No part of yourself has to be amputated. It's the Torah of Achtos Hashem that integrates the soul and the mind and the body and the physical and the spiritual and the halacha and the esoteric, the metaphysical and the physical, the concrete and the emotional, the transcendent, and the imminent. It synthesizes philosophy, but also psychology, science, and physics. It reveals the oneness of pre symptom of Einoid Movade. That's what the Torah of the Alter Rebbe, of Chsidis, and the Alter Rebbe tried to bring it out in a comprehensive way, that you could live with it, you can internalize it, you can breathe it. Chsidis Chabad, this, that's why he says this is the foretaste of the Torah of Mashiach. The Yiris of the Baal And it's interesting, by the Baal he speaks about Yiris Shemayim, and by the Alter Rebbe he speaks about Torah. And that's connected to what we learned before about the Baal Shem Tev and the Alter Rebbe. The, Alter Rebbe, the Baal Shem brought out the Yiris Shemayim in every Jew. He brought out the Oitzer of Yiris Shemayim. In other words, the Etzem Haneshama, that's one with Hashem. The Einoid Mulvade. The Alter Rebbe brought it out in a hergish of a Jew. The Alter Rebbe wanted to bring it out in Torah, explaining it, turning it into a whole sugi, into a shit, into a maha, mahalach and avaydah sasha. Just to give a little marshal, I heard this marshal from Reb Mendel Vechter Schlitter, from Kiryat Malachi in Eretz Yisrael. He once shared with me this marshal. He said, imagine... You put somebody in a bakery and you tell them you're going to be here for 95 years and the purpose of life is that you shouldn't eat any of the danishes or cakes or carbs in this bakery. He says it's absolutely torture. You can't do that to a person. I mean, you could, but it's, 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 it's horrible. And you tell them that if you don't eat any of the pastries here for 95 years, you're going to have eternal pleasure and eternal delight. He says, you can do it, but it's very frustrating. But imagine if you show this person that from the bakery there's a ladder and you can go up to the roof. <laughs> and on top of the roof, there's a whole beautiful world that he can enjoy. And gardens with wonderful food and delicacies that are healthy for him. He says, it's a whole different experience. 
So he says, sometimes in Yiddishkeit, we put somebody in a bakery, God sends your soul into Elam Haza, full of temptations, full of pastries, full of carbs, full of cheesecake, full of marble cake, full of danishes. And he says, don't, 90 years, don't touch this, don't touch this. And if you touch it, you're going to get punished unless you do tshuva. But if you don't, after 95 years, you're going to have eternal bakeries, eternal paradise, where you can eat danishes ad infinitum, and you won't gain weight forever. He says, he says, some Jews live like that, and it's so frustrating, it's so hard. So the Baal Tov came and said, come, let me take you to the roof. Come up, come up. And let me show you a beautiful world outside of the bakery. You could take in sunlight, and you can enjoy nature, and you can hear the chirpings and the songs of the birds, and you can celebrate life, and you can eat healthy things. So you're not anymore stuck in the combat with, with, with the bakery. And he said, that's, that's the idea. So it's, it's a different type of year of Shemayim. So you're Shemayim that comes from pleasure, from the ecstasy. Like the Alter Rebbe once said, Tamuru ki fazucht vetizen as the is gut. There's a tam, there's a flavor, there's a geschmack. I'm not anymore in the state of, of, of a Nebuch case. I'm this Eved, I'm the slave of God, but in 90 years I'm going to get rewards. No. The Jew, according to, according to the Bashan, the Jew doesn't serve Hashem so he should get Ganeiden. No, he serves Hashem and that is the biggest Ganeiden. <laughs> that is Ganeiden. That's the best bakery in the world. Doesn't compete with other bakeries. But for this, you have to get to know about you, you have to get to know your Neshama. And you have to get to know God a little bit. Tamu Ruki Hashem. This is all the Torah that prepares us for the real Nitzachim. This is the Avoida. The Avoida, he says, at the end of Golos is the Nitzachim, not just to get Birudim, not just to be able to come into places and take out the sparks, which is also very powerful, very significant. It means that in everything there's a spark, and my contact with it is in order to take out the spark. But really to go into a space where there's no two kingdoms anymore, there's no Le'umaz anymore, it's a place of complete, complete achdos. It's typhus. Huh? So t- since this is the, the, the achievement of Geula, this Havayda is necessary now because we're the ones who create the world of Geula. What does this mean? That's what even though we say primarily the Avoid in Golos is the Avoid of Birurim, and what's Birurim? Birurim is the lower level of Tzvois, where you're in a combat in order to get the sparks that are everywhere. So, in other words, there's tension. That's what Birurim means. Birurim means is. Don't get caught up in the husk. Be mevarer the toiv, the toiv. Be mevarer the toiv from the ra. That's what birudim is. That's true. And that's why the Kabbalah and the Svarim Agdoshim Achsidus discusses at length that there's always an opportunity for birudim wherever a Jew comes. He has to be mevarer after everything is nitzutz, is this divine energy, and I have to extract the birudim. He says that's true. But because the ultimate gili of La'asid Lavoy depends on our Avaida now, and the ultimate purpose of La'asid Lavoy is what? Is not Birurim, but Nitzachin. What's Nitzachin? Nitzachin means there's no husk, there's no clip anymore, there's no Lo'umaza. So that must be reflected also in our Avaida in the end of Galus to cultivate a new approach. The approach is not anymore an approach of processes. What we call the approach of Birudim, the approach is complete victory, <laughs> complete knockout, complete transformation. There's no enemy anymore. Because what does Birudim mean? Birudim means I'm extracting, I'm extracting something from you and I'm taking it from me. That's like the king going to conquer your territory and get your booty, get your spoil, get your shovel, get your booze. Like it says in the Megillah, right? They wanted. Babiza, they wanted the spoils, they wanted the, the booty. 
or we say Bizas Mitzrayim, the Jews took the, the Birudim, the Nitzutzis from Mitzrayim. The Chiddush of Lasid Lave is Esrua Chatoma Avim and Aretz, Einoid Mulvadoi. Everything is part of oneness. What does this mean in my life today? Ooh, it's a whole, it's a very, very powerful approach. It means that you have to learn to be able to say that life is amazing. Everything is good. Everything is beautiful. How? This was the year of Shemaim of the Baal Shem Tev. The Baal Shem Tev, when he walked in the world, he didn't see the dark world that everybody was living in. He started to see the trees were singing. The, the Rebbe once said that he heard, it says in the stories about the Baal Shem Tev that he was once davening Friday night and the goats nearby, they stood up. They stood up on two legs like people standing in awe as the Baal Shem Tev davened. So people say it was a miracle. It's much deeper than a miracle. It wasn't a miracle. It was by the Baal Shem Tev. Yeah. He saw the davening and the goats as well. So the goats saw it themselves. The whole world was singing. The world is smiling at you. God is smiling at you. Every single situation, you have to look from the perspective of Nitzachen, not from the perspective of Berurim. This is just another opportunity to be able to bring out the truth. There's no toxicity anymore. Now, I know it's easier said than done, because what do you mean? I'm going to finish this mime, I'm going to a situation, I'm going to get angry, I'm going to get stressed. That's why we learn. That's why we learn and we, we realign ourselves with this truth. This is the Avoida, he says, at the end of Golos. The Hine Amir Azal, the Gemara says in Sanhedrin, Sadik Zion, and in Avoida Zorid of Tess. Shit al fishnin hava alma. The world history, as we know it, consists of 6,000 years. Shnei alafim toyu, shnei alafim toyu, shnei alafim yamei samashich. Two millennia. Toyu, chaos. First two millennia. Two a millennia Torah. And two millennia is the days of Mashiach. Meaning, from the time the world was created till the year 2000, it's Toyu, chaos. Avram Avinu was born 52 years before the end of Shnei Allah from Toyu. Avram Avinu was born 1948. You knew that? 1948. Don't confuse it with our 1948. 1948 since creation. In other words, 52 years before chaos ended, and it's because of him that the chaos ended. <laughs> it's because of him that the chaos ended, or the other way around, he knew when to be born. <laughs> when the chaos was, I mean, it was a shidduch of the two. The next 2,000 years, beginning from 2,000, begins 2,000 years of Torah. Of course, those are the millennia when Matan Torah was. Matan Torah was 2448. Almost 500 years after Avram Avinu, 2448. Actually, exactly, Avram Avinu was 1948. And Torah is given in the year 2448. So you're dealing with 500 years after Avram Avinu. And those two millennia go to Torah. Those are the two millennia the Jews go into Eretz Yisrael. They build the first base Hamikdash. They build the second base Hamikdash. The second base Hamikdash is destroyed in the fourth millennium. 3,000... Huh? 3,828. 3,828. It's soon going to be year 4,000. Right before the year 4,000. It's the end of Churban Bayesheni. That begins in Maisa Mashiach. You'll realize the two millennia don't end mamash at the end. They end a little earlier. Avram Avinu was not born in 2000. He's born in 1948. The Churban happens a little before the year 4,000. Because that's what we're learning. You always start preparing. You know, Friday is taste from the food of Shabbos. <laughs> Only taste. You don't have to eat up the whole food of Shabbos. But Tayameha. So therefore, the second thousand is Torah, and then starts Shnei Lof Mesa Mashiach. That starts the year 4,000 till the year 6,000. We're now in the year 5, 7, 81. <laughs> this Maimah was set in the year 5, 7, 21, six, exactly 60 years ago. Close to 6,000. So this is how the Chazal in Sanhedrin and Avodah capture history, 6,000 years. So the Rebbe says, it's not, they're not stum giving interesting insights. They're explaining the process of Avoida. There's the process of Avoida in the time of chaos, process of Avoida in the time of Torah, process of Avoida in the times of Mashiach. So generally, the last 2,000 years is called Yemaisa Mashiach. It's a long time. But Bishnei Alaf Yemaisa Mashiach, or Befrad Be'elef Hashishi, the last 2,000 years of Mashiach, especially when you come to the 6th millennium. When does the 6th millennium begin? The year 5,000. Hey Alafim, that begins the 6th millennium. That was approximately 1,000 years and change after the Churban of Mayusheni. 
that begins the sixth millennium. Especially in the sixth millennium. Befrat besoifas man dikvasa de meshicha. And in the sixth millennium, when you come to the end of the sixth millennium, which is called ikvasa de meshicha, ikvasa de meshicha means you can hear the footsteps of Mashiach, even though the gula is not here. And ikvasa de meshicha also means the soul. Ekev is the soul, the bottom of the foot before Mashiach. Because Jewish history is seen as a living organism. And like the posture of a person, you begin on the head, atop, and you go down all the way to the legs and then to the feet and to the sole of the feet. And that's the generation of Ikvisa the Mashiach. It's the sole of the foot. The Matu Raglin Beraglin. It's a fascinating expression of the Zoyer and Parshas Pekude. The legs confront the legs when the feet come in. They, when the feet encounter the feet, what does this mean? Maturaglin beraglin. So the Sifra Kabbalah explain that every generation of history represents a different part of the human organism. This generation of heads, generations of torsos, of hearts, of abdomens, of arms, of legs. But then there's Kalmot in raglin beraglin. When the feet encounter the feet, the feet of Kedusha encounter the feet of Klippa, Zelo, Maza. In other words, the combat is not on a level of head, and not even on a level of heart, but on a level of legs, of feet, and in the feet itself, the bottom, the ache of Ikvus of the Meshich, Kadmatu Raglam Beraglam. When you need the foot soldiers on the feet to be able to ultimately, what we call boots on the ground, to be able to achieve the ultimate mission with the feet, when you reach the end of history, it's not enough just the Avoid Sabirudim, which is an amazing Avoid. But now you need already the Avoid of victory, even before Mashiach comes. And how does that happen? That happens through the hafatza, through living, through internalizing and spreading in yourself and everywhere around you, the wellsprings of Pnei Yisatayra. Why? Because that's what ultimately is the message of Pnei Yisatayra. What does it mean to live with Pnei Yisatayra? Pnei Yisatayra is not a separate Tayra. It's the Pnei of Nigla. It's to be able to see in everything the absolute oneness of Ein Oid Mulvada. There's no enemy anymore. <laughs> you know the kamikazes, the Japanese kamikazes who thought the Second World War continued years afterwards. Avaida Sabiruda means I'm struggling. I'm struggling with all the shells and all the husks and all the darkness, and I'm trying to find the light in the darkness. And that's a Gavaldik Avaida. Avaida Sabiruda. There's something deeper than Avaida Sabiruda. There's Tzvais, and then there's going back to Tzivis Hashem. And what's deeper than Avedis Abirudim? Where I could really, really reach a space, and it can't be fake, where I don't have to be afraid of anything. I don't have to be afraid of any emotion. I don't have to be afraid of any encounter. Because I can look at it, and I know that this is all an opportunity for growth. It's an alarm clock to help me become who I am, which is always one with infinity. You can straighten out and stretch your posture and become who you really are. Who are you really? A manifestation of divine oneness in this world. To celebrate all the parts of yourself. To celebrate all the parts of your life. Now let's face it, this is not easy language. We're used to gullus language. We almost like the language of anxiety, of quetching. How you doing? Not so good. <laughs> he says, well, you do, how you doing? I'm victorious. We just won the war. <laughs> it's a different posture. It's a different mode. Fully aligned. Fully aligned. There's no dissonance. In other words, don't make a war where there's no war. If you want to see it as war, you can see it as war, but it's only in your mind. There's no war. There's nobody fighting you. There's nobody fighting you. It's a different avoid. It's different energy. It's what, what's going to be when Mashiach... Let's think about it. What's going to be when Mashiach comes? What's going to be? What, what's life going to look like? I'm going to call up, I'm going to get into a fight with my brother-in-law. I'm going to get into a fight with my brother, with my sister. This one is going to get into a fight over a business, over a Yerusha. What, what are you going to do when Mashiach comes? What are we going to do with all the quetching and all the fighting? So you'll say, oh, when Mashiach comes, it's going to be good. <laughs> so the Rebbe says, no, now it's good. Open your eyes now to that reality, and you could live like that. You can live in that consciousness of Eneid Mulvada. Now, it's before Mashiach comes, so that's why... We feel it as a struggle. It's not simple. That's why there's a mimer about it. I have to work on it. Because the, the full gilu is not there. 
but it's not there externally. I can create an internal awareness that creates that reality in my life, and it's a real reality. And different chapters in history challenge us and bring, us, bring out different avoidance within, within, within each of us. This is the avoid of Nitzach. Matu raglin beraglin. When the feet meet the feet. Matu means they come, they, 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 they confront each other, they encounter each other. The Zaya says there that when the raglaim of Kedusha meet the raglaim of Klippa, that's when it says about Mashiach, Va'amdu raglov bayoim hahu. His legs are going to stand, his feet are going to stand that day in the Harazes in one of the Nevuas of La'asid Lover. Va'inyinu, and the explanation in this is. I'm going to go a little faster now because I want to Bezer Hashem finish the Maimer. Two more, two more chapters. The Razal, the Gemara says, in Mesechta Shabbos Nun Vav, in Mesechta Ksuvaz Davtes, Kala Yotzel Melchem is Bez David, get Kaisiv, get Chrysis Lishta. Fascinating Gemara. The Gemara discusses there the story of David Amelech, who had, who had the relations with Bathsheba, who was married to a man named Uriah Hachiti, who was in war. So at first glance, it seems there was a classic case of a terrible, terrible, promiscuous sin. But the Gemara says, Amr Reb Shmuel Bar Nachmeini, Amr Reb Yonasin, Kala Oimir David Chata Eina Yelatoya. If you say that David sinned a regular sin, you're making an error because anyone who went out to the wars of base David used to first give a divorce, a get to his wife. So when David was with Bathsheba, she wasn't a married woman; she was a divorced woman, and the reason was. Because they may die in war, or they may get, they may be missing in action, so not to leave their women, agunois, who won't be able to marry, they would give them a get, and that way there were no strings attached. So if something happened, they were divorced. If they came back, they could remarry. They would marry again. That was the clock. Rashi learns over there a little different that they would give a get with a condition: if I don't come back. You'll be divorced retroactively when I gave you the get. Taisvis argues because that means that until the until the end of the war, until they don't come back or they do come back, they're really married because the get happens later retroactively. Okay, so it's an argument there of Rashi and Taisvis. It's not for now, but the bottom line Taisvis learns is that it was a get, a plain get. Whoever went out to Melchemah's base, David would give a get to his wife. That's the Gemara. We learned in every aspect of Torah there's nigla and there's pnimius. We know what it means, Alpinigla. You go to war, you give a divorce. A gift. So there's no issues. But there's also this Maime Chazal on a deeper level. When you're going out to the war of Beis David, when you're going out to the war to bring Mashiach, you have to learn how to give a get to certain things. To your wife. What does it mean to give a get to your wife? There's a famous sikh, a famous address that the Rebbe Rashab the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe was known as the Rebbe Rashab Reb Shalom Doiv Bershnayos, and he built the famous yeshiva Toim Chitmimim in the city of Lubavitch in Belarus in the year Tofresh Nun Zion. This is 1897. A few years later, Simchas Teira Tofresh Samachalaf. Simchas Teira during Hakafis of 18, 1800, Tofresh Samachalaf 1800, the Rebbe Rashab gave a sicha, special, famous historical talk to his students, hundreds of students, in Temchet Mimim, that's Simchas Torah in Lubavitch Tavr Samachalf. It's known as the Sicha of Kol HaYoytzel HaMelchemes Beis David. That Sicha is an exceptional, exceptional visionary treatise presentation where he speaks about the future of Jewish history. And he speaks about two major challenges that the Jewish people are going to face. And it's an incredible thing because the Rebbe now, who's addressing this in 1961, is sharing in hindsight what his father-in-law's father, the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, shared in 1800. In 1800. Tafresh, I, I'm sorry, I said 1800. 1900. 1900. 1900. My, my stand corrected. So this is 61 years before this Mimer. And I don't have to tell you, between 1900 and 1961, the world has changed quite heavily, especially the Jewish world, to a point that it was unrecognizable. Between the Bolshevik First World War, the Bolshevik Revolution, and then ultimately the Holocaust, and Israel, etc., 
the whole world was transformed, maybe in ways that it wasn't transformed in thousands of years. So this is the sikh of the Rebbe Rashab, he speaks to his students. And he says, He says, there's a war called Melchemes Beis David. David sends out his people in war in order to defeat all the forces that want to undermine Beis David. And those who are drafted into this war, those who are mobilized into this combat, the Gemara says, they have to give a divorce, a writ of divorce. But what does this mean? So he says, the Rebbe Rashab explains elsewhere that we see in Chazal two expressions, David and Ben David. Sometimes they'll say, Ein Ben David Ba, the child of David won't come. Sometimes Mashiach will be referred to David, like in the Haftarah of Ayiga, Sheikheskel, Va'avdi David Melech Aleim Lailam, not Va'avdi Ben David. So he says Ben David means that Mashiach didn't come yet in full revelation. It's the son of David. And David is when the Gula already came in its full intensity. Here it doesn't say Kalayotza Melchem is David. The Melchem is Beis David. Beis David is like the Ben David. It's not yet the full revelation of Mashiach. That's why there's a war. <laughs> if there would be the full revelation of David, you wouldn't have a Melchem. The reason there's a Melchem is because you're still in the stage of Ben David which means we're leading up to David HaMelech's revelation. David is Malka Mashiach, David represents Mashiach. So there's Ben David and there's David, and there's different names for Mashiach. Sometimes we call Mashiach Ben David, which means he's not fully revealed yet, and sometimes there's David, which is the full revelation of Mashiach. What is the war? Chazal tell us, in Psikter Rapsi Tesvav and Medrash Rabbi Shira Shidim, Im Reis Adoy Racha Doy Mecharev, Tzapi Leraglov Shal Mashiach. Fascinating Maimah Chazal. If you see a generation, after a generation, cursing Hashem, wait for the feet of Mashiach. What does this mean? You see a dir after a dir, mecharif. Mecharif means antagonistic, angry, provoking, negative, full of toxic energy, opposing. Wait for Mashiach. Why? Because the Pasuk says, in the end of Kapitol Peites of Tehillim, Asher Cheifu, Oivecha Hashem, Asher Cheifu Ikvis Meshichecha, Boruch Hashem Lo Elam Amen Vamen. Cheifu Oivecha Hashem means your enemies of God are trying to undermine you and curse you. Cheifu Ikvis Meshichecha. They are undermining the footsteps of Mashiach. Blessed is God forever. What's the connection? If you see generation after generation, Cheifu Oivecha Hashem. And Chefu Ikvis Meshichecha is Baruch Hashem Lo'elam Amen Vamen. I want to talk and see how they translate it into English. I made my own translation. But let's see. Psalms, uh, Psalms 89. It's good to know the exact translation. Psalms 89. It's a long capital in Tehillim. So all the way at the end. Mamish at the end. Pasuk Nun Beis. Asher Chefu Evecha Hashem. Your enemies disgraced you, God. They disgraced you. And they disgraced the ends of your anointed, the footsteps of Mashiach. Blessed is the Lord. Amen v'yamen. So Chazal say, when you see generation after generation disgracing you, being so antagonistic, comes the Rebbe Rashab and he says, that's the Melchemes Beis David. And there's two generations. Dor acher dor. One is Cherfu Oivecha, and one is Cherfu Ikvis Meshichecha. One generation that Tehillim says is antagonistic to the Lord, to Hashem. And one is antagonistic to Ikvis Meshichecha, to the concept of Geula. What does this mean? So he says like this, like the Rebbe said then to the students of the yeshiva, Shebeiz HaDoides and Beiz Shuras. The two generations represent two rows, a dar, dar, dar in Aramaic, dar is also a line, two lines. There are those 
your enemies who disgrace Hashem. They oppose anything that's connected to Torah and Mitzvahs. Of course, they oppose also the concept of Mashiach. Anything of Yiddishkeit, they're antagonistic to. And the Rebbe Rashab said, this is the first generation that we are going to be dealing with. And remember, this is 1900. At that time, there was mass, mass alienation. You know, the Holocaust eclipsed ever what happened. But in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s, most of the Jews lived in Russia, Eastern Europe. And there was a mass alienation from Judaism. And from within, a lot of the Jews were new isms that tried to undermine everything of Torah and Mitzvahs. Then, of course, 17 years later would be the Bolshevik Revolution, which would give power to the communists. And that would, and in the next 70 years, they would obliterate every vestige of Judaism in the Soviet Union. But even before the 70 years, the Yevsekcia, the Jewish party, the Jewish section of the Communist Party, what they accomplished in 10 years, from 1919 to 1929, 10 years of the Yevsekcia, didn't accomplish more than 200 years of enlightenment or 150 years of enlightenment accomplished. 10 years of the Yevsekcia and the communism. This is the first generation. And it was done, unfortunately, by Jews. The head of the Yevsekcia was Shimon Dimenstein. Shimon Dimenstein was a yeshiva bacher. I believe he learned and tells. There's even uh, there's those who say that he got smiche from Reb Chaim Oizeg Radzensky. Zeichet Tzadik Levrocha, the Rav of Vilna. One of the greatest leaders and rabbinic authorities of the time. Reb Chaim Oizeg passed away in 1940. Some say Shimon Dimenstein got smiche and he became the head of the Yevsekcia, which uprooted every vestige of Judaism in the Soviet Union and ultimately tried to kill and murder the freed Rebbe Rayat in 1927. It's a separate story, but this is all Cher for Evecha Hashem that the Rebbe Rashab speaks about in 1900. There's going to be a generation of Jews who will try to destroy everything that's connected to godliness. This was their inner, inner, inner shame, inner guilt, inner trauma from Gullus, inner self-hatred. It's not the anti-Semitism, it's the self-hatred, their embarrassment. They felt that if they embrace socialism and communism and, and uh, all of the different secular isms, the world will love the Jews and all problems will go away. That's the first generation. But then the Rebbe Rashab speaks about another generation. This is already much more subtle. He says, V'yeshnam ke'elu she'cherfu ikvis m'shichecha. But there are those, they're not enemies of Hashem. Chas what, what they, what they're not, what, they're, what they can't embrace is the footsteps of Mashiach. What does it mean? They're not enemies of Yiddishkeit. They could learn Torah, they observe mitzvahs. But there, there's a coldness, there's an apathy, there's a complacency. I do everything. But I'm like a robot. I'm like a zombie. I do it. I'm obligated. But there's no passion. There's no varamkeit. Your soul, bechol is missing. There's no nigin. There's no inner fire. The fire is not burning. I'm cold. I do everything. I'm not an enemy. I'm a good guy. <laughs> I do the checklist. I'm a sekalt. I'm cold. Vare ben kritis lekfiri yesh mechitzadaka. The Rebbe said that in the Sikh Simchas Torah 1900 between kfira. And Kriris is a thin wall. Kfira means heresy. Kriris is coldness. He says a very thin veil between the two. Between Kfira and Kriris is a very, very thin. And we understand why. When there's apathy, when there's indifference, then it's very easy to cross that border. And they have this sense of coldness and indifference and smugness and complacency. It's like a cynicism. That they bring into everything in Torah, it's ubefrat bemunah bebiyas Mashiach. Especially when it comes to the amunah and Mashiach, what are you getting excited? What are you? What are you? As such a serious believer in Mashiach? Take it easy, because Mashiach really drives a person crazy. It's such a person crazy, because Mashiach really means that Torah is real, mitzvahs are real, enoid mulvada, God is real. <laughs> the world is going to be a divine world. Relax. This is a different type of cherfu. It's not the Jew who laughs from Yiddishkeit, the Jew who undermines Yiddishkeit. Chas He does everything. But there's a sense of coldness. There's no fire burning. And this is the pain that this Jew is going through, that this Jewish soul is going through. 
So the Rebbe says, David. The based David consists of these two stages in Jewish history. One is the stage where you're battling, where you're trying to push it, save Yiddishkeit, save Torah. And one is where Torah exists, mitzvahs exists. But you want to find the soul. You want to find the passion. You want people to be able to have real amuna, real pnimius, real chius. They should be able to live with Yiddishkeit, including the Amunah and Biyas HaMashiach with, with, the, the, with, the entire, with their entire zest and passion and umph and pnimius. In Mitzray Shabbos Maimah, the Rebbe adds that the Rebbe Rashab said then, in that Sikha, he said, it also includes people who believe that everything about Mashiach is going to be natural. It's just going to come through natural means. You know, ultimately, the world will allow Jews to do certain things. They don't believe in the divine revelation of Bias HaMashiach. It's all part of the same thing. You know, how seriously do you take it? Come comes the Rebbe Rashab and saying, if you want to win this war, you can't be complacent. Because this is a war against complacency. This is a war against robotic Judaism. This is a combat against an empty Yiddishkeit. A Yiddishkeit that doesn't fill your whole soul, your whole heart. The only way you can win such a type of combat is inner peace. And most importantly, you are completely dedicated. You're in all the way. You're not in 50%. That's the idea of you have to write a get to your wife. Get to your wife doesn't mean you have to divorce your wife. Chas v'shalom. Shalom bayis is the only way you can accomplish these things. Get krisis li'ishto is a metaphor for all those things in life that we become attached to. But they're not a lakus. So he says you have to give a divorce to the hanachas ha'elam ha'chumri to all of the paradigms of the materialistic, brute world. There are certain paradigms of what it means to be in the world. You have to let go of those paradigms. You have to liberate yourself from them. there could be things that the Torah permits you. That's what I, marriage is. Marriage is not something that's forbidden. Your wife is something that you're allowed to be with her. You married her, Kadas Moshe Yisrael. So get Chris's Kais of is symbolic of the idea that when they went to war, they had to cut their attachment with everything. They had to be completely engaged in this battle. What does this mean symbolically? We're not talking about chas v'shalom, a physical divorce. But we mean you can't have any strings attached to anything else. Complete loyalty. When they went to Melchemes Beis David, if they were thinking about family, you know what happens in war. Unfortunately, war is war. You've got to be there fully. If you're there 90%, you're not going to be successful. He says, this Melchemes Beis David requires soldiers who are completely dedicated. Unconditionally dedicated with unwavering commitment they're not 50 percent 60 percent 80 percent 90 percent they're all in their whole soul is in they're all there even those things that are permitted al pitaida if it's not part of this mulham it's not part of my life there's complete dedication and loyalty like ishto ishto is a symbol of something that's permissible al pitaida but if it's not essential to this war of einaid mulvadai then it's going to confuse you then you will not be able to be successful we need soldiers of a different magnitude. You see here how the Rebbe was training people? You understand? You see how he was training people? <laughs> this is how he lived, and this is how he wanted to inspire people to live. He says, you want to bring Geula to the world, you have to be fully in. And it's all based on the idea. Because what's Geula? 
Geula is that we're fully integrated. Geula is that there's no space outside of God. I cannot bring Geula to the world if inside of me there is a space outside of God. You understand? So I have to be able to write a get. And I have to be able to say, you may be wonderful, I'm not judging anybody, but you are completely in. There's no, nothing else. There's absolutely nothing. There's a single-mindedness, a focus, a determination that comes from a deep, infinite dedication and commitment to the MS and nothing but the MS. And therefore, even those things that are permitted, it's not about guilt, it's not about punishment, we're not blaming you, but it's already of a different nature. You're not a compartmentalized person. You're completely in. You're just completely in. It's a different type of relationship. It's really what a good marriage is supposed to look like, right? What's a marriage supposed to look like? Marriage is supposed to look like, you're not 90% married. Some days yes, some days not. Shabbos afternoon, no. By the Kiddush, no. You're in. You're fully in. That's what a marriage with Hashem is. You're fully in. And that's the idea. Even those paradigms of the world that are mutter al they're not forbidden. But the real soldier, the Melchemes based David, must emancipate himself from any of these paradigms. He doesn't live in a confined world. He doesn't live in a world of social conformity. He doesn't live in a world where he has to find out what other people think in order to find out if it's acceptable or not. He lives in the world of Melchemes Beis David, of Ein Eid Malvade Mamish, infinite love. Love to every Jew, love to every creature, infinite love to God, infinite love to Taita. You live with infinite love. You create the paradigms. You don't respond to paradigms. It's very different. You're not a victim of your circumstances. That's what he says. Get rid of, you're not a victim. This is how we do it. This is how we don't do it. This is how we think. Now you'll soon see that the Rebbe is soon going to say that this is not about hefkedis. It's not about, you know, chaotic frivolousness. <laughs> you know, it's not about that. It, it, ultimately, it, re- it really requires structure as well. And that's the idea, we spoke about the king, that he splurges all the pleasure, all the pleasures, all the treasures. He splurges all the treasures to win. He says, this is exactly what the soldier has to do as well. He has to go away from all of his cheshbonis and be mafkir everything. In other words, everything is at stake. He puts himself completely into this. It's not like he says, you know, part of me is, 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 not, is not engaged. I am fully, fully engaged. As long as there are treasures that I hold back, as long as I'm not ready to splurge, to bring in all of my oitzras, and I say, this is mutter al this I could keep in my, uh, in, my, in my treasure chest, in my safe. The Rebbe says your calculations may be right and may be rational and may even be based on holiness. They may even not be kedusha. But ultimately, to be able to be Megala based David in the world, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. There's a story of the Arizal. It's an amazing story. The Rebbe said this over Shabbos Shmini Tavshin Yud Ches, 1958. It's in Shvachi Harizal. It was Friday afternoon before Shabbos. The Arizal called his students in Svas and he said, Chevra, you want to go be Makabal Shabbos in Yerushalayim? Let's go welcome the Shabbos Friday night in Yerushalayim. So the students looked at him and said, now, obviously from Tzvast to Yerushalayim by car <laughs> is a three-hour drive. In the 1500s, there's no cars. So you're going to have to walk. <laughs> or take a camel, if it's before Shabbos, or a donkey or a horse. But there's no way they're making it. He didn't tell this to them on Tuesday or Wednesday. He told them Friday evening. But on that result, there's no questions. So he said, you want to do it? So some of the students said, well, we have to first go home and consult our wives and get permission from our wives. And if our wives say, yeah, then we'll do it. So we can't do it yet. And Darizal became very serious and he said, ah, if we would have gone together now to Yerushalayim to welcome Shabbos, we could have brought Mashiach. So the Rebbe said over the story, he says, what do you mean? You have to ask your wife. It's Allah and Shulchan Aruch. You don't just go, famous Shalah. Yaakov didn't just leave Lavan. He went to ask Rachel and Leah. You have to respect your wife more than respect yourself. You don't just travel somewhere without telling your wife. You have to speak to your wife first. Rebbe said, that's Emes. You have to. But the Arizal needed people 
who are soldiers, they knew that Arizal knows how to learn. He also knows Shulchan Aruch. He's also a tzaddik. He also knows what Shalom Bayas is. When he says right now, let's go to Yerushalayim, you got to be able to trust Arizal and say, we're going to Yerushalayim. And if you say one second, I still didn't have my cup of coffee. I still didn't go to gym. I still didn't go to therapy. I still didn't do my exercise. I have to talk to my wife. There's a system. I have to call the office. You're a good guy. But the victory, you're not going to be able to achieve. Not because you're not good, not because you don't have right calculations, but because this requires that you're completely in. Not because you don't care about your family. On the contrary, when you're completely in, you care more about your family <laughs> because you're not selfish. You're not narcissistic. You're completely in. And if my Avedis Hashem right now is to be with my spouse, with my children, it's all the way. It's infinite. It's not about abandonment of responsibility, people who run to help other people and they abandon their own wife and children. That's not Avedis Hashem, that's Tamif Kedis and Narish Kaid. They're running away from their own pain. We're not talking about that. But we're talking about transcending my own limitations, my own calculations of what makes sense to me, what makes me comfortable, my own comfort zone. It's not so much running away from your wife, it's running away from things that you need to make you comfortable so that you should feel safe and secure and you don't have that trust in the infinity of the moment and in the urgency of the situation. That's called bizbuz ha'itzris. That's called all my ha'itzris go into this war. Everything. Everything goes into this war. There's no, nothing left behind. And the, those who are involved in Melchemes Beis David, there's nothing left behind. It's completely it. And, 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 and it's fascinating, you know, how the Lubavitcher Rebbe talks about this, because anybody who saw him and knew how he lived, this was, this was how he lived. There was bizbazites. There was, there was nothing left behind. There was, the dedication was absolute. Dedication to the people, of, to the Jewish people. Dedication to Torah, dedication to Yerushalayim, the dedication to Avas Yisrael. Dedication to Amuna, dedication to Bias and Mashiach. It was just there was nothing, nothing that was not brought into it. Just, to, just one example. Every normal person takes vacation. You go for a week to Miami, right? It's almost a mitzvah. You go for a week to Miami. It's winter. You go for a week to Miami. Matayv two weeks. Matayv three weeks. It's a yeshiva week. And if you can go for three months, Gavaldik, if somebody else could run the business, Gavaldik. And if you could go for five months, fine. If you can make a trip to some other places. And it's not a bad thing. People need to rest. People need to relax. People, sometimes that's what Davai Des Hashem needs. So maybe you've got to go away with your kids. Have some fun with them. But an interesting thing about the Rebbe is, from the day that he became a Rebbe in 1950 until the last day on earth, 1994, not a single day off when he had a cold and when he was sick and when he had a heart attack and when he was weak and when he was older and when he was younger. Not a single day, no such a thing, we're not showing up today. You would think after some chastayda, there's big rebbe's, fine Jews, after some chastayda, they take a week off. The, the tishrei is so hard. <laughs> the rebbe, the next day, it was full force, full intensity. And I think one of the reasons is this mimer. One of the reasons is this mimer. The rebbe understood that we're now fighting a different type of war. We live in freedom. We live in a democracy. We're not living in Tsarist Russia. We're not living in Bolshevik Soviet Union. This is 1961. And certainly today with much more prosperity and much more advancement. But there's a different type of Mulchama. It's the urgency to bring Geula to the world. It's not to become complacent. It's a war against complacency, against paralysis, against staying in my comfort zone, against becoming comfortable with my Yiddishkeit. It's being sensitive to what, where the Shechin is, Shechin to Begalusa. It's being sensitive to mass assimilation, to mass alienation, to the fact that Gula is not here, to the fact that there's so much inner pain, even if externally there's so much comfort and prosperity. That requires a type of urgency from within. There's no foreign enemies to help us crystallize our ideals. A lot of our grandfathers were living at the edge every day of their life. They knew exactly who they were because they knew who their enemies were. Today it's very different. I don't know who my enemy is. My enemy comes sometimes from within. And you have millions and millions of Jews who are fully assimilated and integrated because they don't have an outer enemy. Even with, despite all the anti-Semitism, there's still so much comfort. That's a very different type of war. It's the war of really discovering your inner, inner passion and commitment. And for this, you have to be all the way in, in a way 
more extreme than when there's a physical battle because it's completely from within and externally, you know, you have to look normal. <laughs> You're not fighting a war. This was the type of Mulchemah's based over that Rebbe is describing here. And he says and he adds at the end of this paragraph. <clears throat> and I'm going to I'm going to say the rest outside because I want to. Uh, I know we said the shoe is going to go till nine, and I'm already nine minutes late. So I'm going to say the rest another few minutes just outside, so you'll get the 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 rest of the picture, and you could learn inside yourself. The Rebbe says, and when you're in this mode. It's no so not about big things or small things. Remember, we learned in the previous year, number four, that Nitzachain, the king, it's not about the booty. It's about that there shouldn't be a space in the world where the MS is not revealed. And if there's one place where there's darkness, one place where there's an enemy, one place where there's a rebellion, the king wants that his Ratzain should be implemented over there too. Vieda kol pol kiatapialtai. In this level of Nitzachen, there's no small and there's no big. You don't say, this person is too small for me to deal with him. This is insignificant. This is a little child who cares about him. This is a little community. Eh, this is a little thing in my life. He says, when you're in this mode, there's absolutely no difference. Because it's all about oneness. Remember, there is the type of victory that even a small person craves for. And those are things where you calculate, this is important for me, this is not important for me, this I'll stand up for, this I'll not stand up for. He says, but a real melech for whom real nitzachin is necessary. What's real nitzachin? Real nitzachin is that the emes should be revealed in everything. So he says, even something that seems insignificant, it's not a big thing, nonetheless, the Nitzachan has to happen over there, and you will splurge your deepest treasures and your very life in order to transform even that opposition which seems insignificant. There's no such a thing we say, this avoid is small, this person is irrelevant, eh, forget it. In this avoid of Malchemes Beis David, if it's in God's world, it has purpose, it has meaning, it has significance. And you'll give your whole passion to one Jew like you'll give to Klal Yisrael. You'll give your passion even one little mitzvah, one little inyan, saving a Jew from a, an Isser Menatayr, an Isser Medivre Seifrem, the Rebbe said an Isser Kalshel Divre Seifrem, a Kaitzer Shal Yud, with the same commitment, with the same passion. Why? Because you're not living in the place of cheshboinus, of calculations. What's worth it, what's not worth it. When you're living in Melchemes Beis David, you're in tune to Midas HaNetzach, to Tzvois. What's Tzvois? Tzvois is Tzivis HaShem, to be able to be Megala, Eneid Mulvadi and everything. Then, just like for God, there's no big and small. HaShav HaMachagamun, for you also not. The Baal Shem Tov Tor Pratis means in one little leaf, there is divine providence like there is with the black hole, like there is with the whole planet. So why are you making the difference? I'm making the difference because for me, this seems important, this doesn't seem important. But when I'm in a line with this space of Midas HaNetzach, everything is important, everything is significant. And you don't know what's big, what's small. The smallest thing could be as significant as the biggest thing. And he says, this is the Melchemes Beis David. Melchemes Beis David is a person divorces. You sever your cords with everything else outside of Einoid Movada. Get Christmas. You have to give a get. You have to say goodbye, goodbye to the world because you're going to bring out the real world. You have to say goodbye to everything. It's not like you say goodbye to 90%. You are one person. You're a soldier of Hashem. You are a conduit for Eina and Malvade. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You see love everywhere. You see godliness everywhere. And this is who you become. This is the Mulchemes Beis David. He says, Everything that's inside of me goes into this. I throw myself in completely. He says, this creates reciprocity from above also. Hashem also splurges all of his treasures. Works both ways. 
I splurge and he splurges. Uh, he brings the Gemaras. The Gemara in Yuma. You sanctify yourself a little bit. Hashem sanctifies you a lot. Whoever comes to be cleansed, Hashem gives him tremendous help. What does he give you? The Oitzer of Yerushalayim. The Oitzer, the treasures, the Oitzer of Yerushalayim. The Gemara speaks in Brachas and Shabbos about the Oitzer of Yerushalayim. The Oitzer of Yerushalayim means the deepest treasures of Yerushalayim. What's the deepest treasures of Yerushalayim? You remember? Not Yerushalayim that's based on punishment, but Yerushalayim that's based on real closeness to Hashem. And then he says the most serious Aveda and the smallest Aveda are identical. It's not a difference. Because it's not anymore a checklist of what's serious, what's not serious. It's Yerushalayim where even the smallest thing I stay away from. Because I'm in touch with the Eretz of Yerushalayim. I'm in touch with the Pnimius of Yerushalayim. I'm in touch with Eneid Melvadeh. Even something that's permitted, but it's not what Hashem wants. He says, when you have real Yerushalayim and you know that something is not what Hashem wants, it's done. You're done. Everything is similar. You say, yeah, but it's not a big deal. It's not going to make such a difference. There's real Yerushalayim. There's no difference. The moment you know this is not the Ratzon of Hashem, you're done. And then he says, but Hashem doesn't only splurge his oitzras. He also endangers his very life. And that's the idea of Galu Adam Shechinei Maham. That the king comes into the war with every single Jew. He's there with you in the trenches. Kvayachal, Hashem endangering his life. What does it mean? It means Hashem in his own essence puts himself out there completely. Boyal Para, yeah, the Zohar. The Zohar says, Moshe was frightened. So Hashem didn't say, go to Para. He said, come to Para. I'm coming with you. I am with you in the Golos. Why? Because we have to win this war together. Not just Birurim, but victory. And for this, he splurges all of his deepest oitzdes, all of his deepest, deepest pleasures. And that's why it says about Mashiach, Praza is Teish of Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim is going to be open without walls. The Gemara says in Psachim on the Pasuk, Tzidkas Pirz Zainai Bi Yisrael. Or Pizirainai. It says, so it, it says, Sitkas Pirzainai. Pirzainai means openness, prozis. But the Gemara says it's like Sitkas Pizirainai. Hashem did a tzedakah that he scattered the Jews among all the nations because they get gerim, they get converts. But spiritually, what does that mean? It means because of the converts, that's why we had to go into Gaulus. It means the sparks. In every place we go, we pick up the sparks. That's Sitkas. Pizirayna, Pizir on the Beinomas, we pick up the sparks everywhere. But the ultimate avoid is should be Prozis Teish of Yerushalayim. After you pick up the sparks, but there's still enemies, you want to go to a place where Yerushalayim is open, not walled. You know why you don't need a wall? You know why you don't need a wall? Because you don't have an enemy. You only need fortresses when you have enemies. When you don't have enemies, you don't need fortresses. That's his hapcha. That's Tzivis Hashem, where you have the complete transformation, not just the Avaidas Habarurim, but also the Avaidas the Hanitzachem. The last section, chapter Yud, the Rebbe concludes the Maimer where the Rebbe Rayatz in the Maimer said that these treasures are given to the foot soldiers. They're distributed through the commanders and the generals, but they're given to the foot soldiers. They're given to the people in the front lines, the people who fight the war, the people who are dedicated, the people who are into the Melchemes Beis David, to bring the awareness of Hashem everywhere in the world, to every Jew, to every situation, beginning with themselves. That's the ultimate tzava. And he goes back to the three interpretations of tzava. There's tzava, which means time. Halayt tzava le'enash, the first shear, because things are fixed in time and space. There's tzava as integration, beauty and harmony. We always have to be integrated. And then there's tzava as an army, which is Kabbalah Sel, the Kal HaYoytzel HaMolchemes Beis David. And... Just as when the person goes into tzava, it says, Da mala mila mimach. The Perkeyavis says, You should know what's above you. So the Baal Shem Tov said, You should know that everything that's above comes from you. Da mala mila mimach. Whatever is above comes from you. So when the Avaida of a Jew is in Melchemes based David, Hashem also opens up all the treasures. And what is this? So it's Oitzr Shayir Shemayim, but he says it's also the Oitzris of Pnimi Yisatayra. The splurging of the pleasures of Hashem in this war is the gili of Teresa Baal Shem Tev. 
the Baal Shem Tov's Torah and the Torah of the Alter Rebbe, the Torah of Chesidus, this is the Oitzeres, the deepest Oitzeres that were concealed for generations. They were never, they were never, maybe even if they were shown, but they were never splurged. But for the final victory, Hashem splurged the deepest Oitzeres. This is Torah of Baal Shem Tov, Torah of the Alter Rebbe, the Torah of Pnimi Yisa Torah, because as Rashi says, this is the Torah of Mashiach, Yishakeni Menashik Espiyu. And this was splurged in order. He says, Hagiluyim Hayoyser Nailim de Pnimi Yisa Torah Shei Yisgalu La'asit. The deepest revelations of Torah, which really are going to be revealed when Mashiach comes, these are the treasures that the Melech Hashem splurges for the soldiers, because it's only with this that they can really achieve the victory. So the Melech comes himself into Golas. He gives his deepest oysters, which is the ultimate, ultimate depths of Torah that were revealed through the Baal Shem Tev and the Rebbe and the students of the Baal Shem Tev, all of the students throughout all the generations, all the branches of the students of the Baal Shem Tev. The Alter Rebbe brought it into Chachma, Bina Daz, that it should be internalized. This is the oysters, so that the war could be won. And he says, but remember that Sava doesn't only mean an army, it also means time. Because, and this is the end of the Maimer, this war is not about frivolousness. Things have to be done in the right time and in the right place. In other words, you're in an army, but the word Sava means fixed time. You have to always make sure to channel the infinity into the finite vessels. Everything has its time. Everything has its space. And ultimately, when Mashiach comes, the greatest revelations are also going to be in time and space. We're not going to go to a world that's beyond time and space. The ultimate Chiddush of Mashiach is that this world of time and space will be fused with divine infinity to the point that the physical guf will feel a lakus. Like it says, the physical flesh, which is the very physical reality, which is connected to time and space. We live in a reality of time and space, the physicality. That itself will become a conduit for absolute divinity because everything will become one. The glory of God will be revealed and all the flesh will see that everything is one. This concludes at least one dimension of the Maimer of Basi Lagani Tavshin Chafalov, the first Maimer, which was said Friday night. There's a second Maimer that Rebbe said the next day by the Fabreng in Vahib Shalach Pare and Metzai Shabbos. He said again the Maimer Basi Lagani. Those were the three Maimarim. We had the schus to learn at least the first Maimer. I want to remind you all that tomorrow morning, 7 30, we're going to continue and finish the Maimer of Torah Ur Parshas Boy about Tzvais that was referenced here. That's going to be tomorrow, 7.30, on the yeshiva.net. Metzoy Shabbos, which is Yud Shvat, the Yom Hayelula of the Rebbe Rayatz, and the day that the Rebbe became, the Rebbe assumed leadership of Chabad, 1950, 1951, 70 years ago. We'll have a big Malava Malka and Fabrengen. Of course, according to the guidelines of health officials, please be very cautious and very careful, especially if there's an issue. We're going to have a Fabrengen in the tent, 24 Shea Road, 8 o'clock p.m. with live participation, hot food, beautiful Malava Malka, music, etc. For those of you who want to tune in virtually, the live stream will begin at 8.30, Mitzayi Shabbos, right here at theyeshiva.net, T-H-E-Y-E-S-H-I-V-A.net. The live stream begins 8.30 p.m. The Malava Malka begins at 8, this coming Mitzayi Shabbos. I wish everybody a wonderful, meaningful, inspiring day a day in which we can live oneness, see oneness, breathe oneness, and achieve the victory of Melchemes Beis David and see the gili of Nigla Kvayd Hashem Vero Kol Basar Yachtov, Kifi Hashem Dibir. Thank you very much. Have a beautiful day. Gewaldik. You feel the passion, huh? The Rebbe's passion, huh? All in, all in. No compartmentalizations. Loyalty. Loyalty. Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, yeah. The second generation, he says, they're not opposed to Torah mitzvahs. They just like to keep it cold. <laughs> they like to keep it cold. Their neshamas are starving. You see people, they, 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 they want the Varimkite. The souls are starving, so you need the soldiers 
to warm up, to warm up Klal Yisrael. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rabbi Avram Kaliske, yeah, they, some of them did somersaults. Yeah, the, yeah. That's why at the end of the Maimed Rebbe says it has to be Tzav and Zman and Makkam. In other words, to make sure that it's, uh, it's integrated. It's integrated boundaries because, because, not because you're afraid, but because you want to transform the world. You don't want, you want to be effective. You don't want to be radical. You know what I mean? I can be a radical and scream at the rooftops and I say, okay, another Meshuggah Pushing the limits, yeah. Yeah. Bizbuza But not go over the limit. Right. You want to, because the whole point is we want to reveal that the limits themselves are also part of Hashem. So we don't run away. The famous expression of the Alter Rebbe, Oiruz de Toyu, Bekalem de Tikkun. Oiruz de Toyu, Bekalem de Tikkun. Rebbe Nsiyan, it's a pleasure to have you from Antwerp. I'm so happy you're here with us. And everything should be with a lot of Hatzlocha. People wrote some very interesting comments on this Mimer. A lot of comments. So I encourage you to read them. And I wish you all a beautiful, beautiful day. And Hatzlocha with everything. And I'll see you tomorrow, Be'ez Hashem, 7.30. We'll continue learning. We'll continue fighting the Melchemes Be'ez David to bring the Pnimius of all of Torah into the world. Zuhi, this is like zehu in 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 masculine. Zuhi is feminine. Zuhi, this is <laughs> like zehu zeh. Rebaran, it's a pleasure and a privilege to have you with us. And all of you, all of you, all of you. What an expression. When the legs, when the feet encounter the feet. The feet of Kedusha encounter the feet of Klippa. <laughs> the boots encounter the boots. Boots on the ground. Interesting expression. That's the Avaidah. Ikvus Meshicha. The feet. Execution. <laughs> Implementation. Getting it down, getting it down into the feet, making it real, grounded, grounded. Can't be in the head. <laughs> you got to get it into the feet. Not only even, not only in the stomach, stomach too, but you got to get it into the feet. The Friede Karebbe gave out the Maimer Bossi Lagani 20 chapters in 1950, 1950. It happens to be that the day he published it, the next day to learn it that Shabbos, he passed away. So that became like his final will and testament, so to speak. So each year on the yards at Yutzvat, the Rebbe would say this Maimer and focus on one chapter from the 20 chapters. So that year, 1961, was chapter 11. It studied over 20 years. Each year he focused on one chapter. That's why we're learning this chapter this year because 2021 is again chapter 11 in the cycle. The first cycle finished 1970. The second cycle finished 1990. The third cycle finished 2010. And now we're in the middle of the fourth cycle, 2021 which will be finished 2030. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, it's incredible stuff. Incredible stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Each one is a, a timeless gem of of of, of divine depth of, of the depth of Torah. The Pnimi Satayra that we're learning about, yeah. Yeshakanim and Ashikas Pio. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Chevra, have a beautiful day. Hatzlach Rabba with everything.